The knee is the largest joint in the human body and is a modified synovial hinge joint that allows for flexion, extension, and rotation. It is comprised of three bones, including the femur, the tibia, and the patella. The bony architecture allows for the knee to provide stability and control under a variety of loading conditions. The femur is the longest and strongest bone in the body. It is broader at the distal end, forming the medial and lateral condyles, which articulate with the medial and lateral condyles of the proximal tibia, for forming the tibiofemoral joint of the knee. These articulating surfaces of the femur and tibia allow for 160 degrees of flexion and 5 degrees of hyperextension by rolling and gliding with respect to one another. This mechanism allows for the joint to lock in extension so it can be held with minimal energy expenditure through a process known as the screw hole mechanism. The patella is the largest sesamoid bone in the body and lies embedded in the tendon of the quadriceps femoris group. The patella femoral joint consists of the medial and lateral articular surface on the posterior aspect of the patella that articulates with the medial and lateral femoral condyles respectively. This articulation increases the efficiency of the quadriceps femoris by increasing the length of the lever arm. The muscles that surround the knee joint act to promote movement of the lower limb and provide stability. There are three main muscle groups that act on the knee. The first group is the quadriceps femoris, which includes the vastus medialis, vastus intermedius, vastus lateralis, and rectus femoris. The second group is the hamstrings, which includes biceps femoris, semimembranosus, and semitendinosus. And the third group is the gastric nemii, which includes the medial and lateral heads. The quadriceps are responsible for knee extension and are known to be the most important stabilizers of the knee complex. The hamstring muscles are the primary knee flexors, which are assisted weakly by gracilis, sartorius, and the gastric nemii. Semitendinosus, semimembranosus, gracilis, and sartorius are all muscles that insert on the medial aspect of the tibia and facilitate internal rotation. Tibial external rotation is facilitated by biceps femoris, which inserts on the lateral aspect of the tibia. The knee joint contains smooth, lubricated fibrocartilage that attaches proximally on the tibial plateau called menisci and serves to deepen the surface of the plateau. Despite having a comparable function, the medial and lateral menisci have slightly different configuration. The medial menisci takes on a semicircular shape and covers 50% of the medial articular surface, while the lateral menisci is circular in shape and occupies 70% of the lateral articular surface. The menisci have an important role in the biomechanical function of the knee, helping to minimize stress on the joint by increasing the surface area of contact between the femur and tibia. In addition, the menisci plays a role in stability, nutrition, joint lubrication, proprioception, shock absorption, as well as load transmission and dissipation by absorbing approximately 50-70% to 70 of the load during weight bearing. In addition to muscles and menisci, there are four main ligaments that work to provide passive stability for the knee. There are two collateral ligaments, the medial collateral ligament and the lateral collateral ligament and two cruciate ligaments, the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. When the knee is fully extended, both the collateral ligaments are taut, and as the knee is flexed, they progressively become less taut to allow, as well as limit, rotation of the knee joint. The name of the cruciate ligaments is due to their anatomical fig configuration, as they form an X within the knee capsule. They are situated within the joint capsule, but outside of the synovial cavity of the joint. The cruciate ligaments work together to resist hyperextension, hyperflexion, and excessive internal and external rotation of the knee joint. During activities that involve cutting or jump landing, the ACL is often one of the most commonly injured structures. Therefore, it is important to have an understanding of the anatomical characteristics of the ACL in order to understand the structure of the ligament, the mechanism of injury, and different diagnostic testing. The ACL originates on the medial aspect of the lateral femoral condyle and travels an oblique path distally, medially, and anteriorly to its insertion point on the anterior aspect of the intercondyloid fossa of the tibia. The ligament is composed of regular, oriented, dense, connective tissue and fibroblasts, mainly composed of type 1 and type 3 collagens. The ACL acts as a primary restrictor to anterior translation of the tibia in relation to the femur. Secondarily, it acts as a restraint to internal rotation of the tibia, valgus varus, and hyperextension of the knee. 
The balance of elastic and stiffness properties within the ACL facilitates its function. Pathomechanically, an ACL tear occurs when there is excessive tension applied to the ligament. A person can create the te this tension force or moment at the knee, which in turn applies an excessive load on the ACL, causing it to be susceptible to injury. The ACL may tear anywhere from the point of origin to the point of insertion. The tear in the fibers occurs when the applied load exceeds the ultimate tensile load of approximately 2100 newtons. The amount of force in an intact ACL can range from 100 newtons during a passive knee extension to 400 newtons when walking and up to 1700 newtons when cutting or decelerating. The Lockman, anterior drawer, and pivot shift test are three basic tests used to examine the structural integrity of the ACL. However, these can provide varying results based on their specificity and sensitivity. There is a new test that has recently been developed and is called the Lever Sign Test. There is a small amount of research stating that this test is superior to the previously three to stated. A study comprised of 400 patients with both acute and chronic, as well as complete and incomplete ruptures of the ACL, rated the ACL sensitivity and specificity at 100%. However, this study was conducted by one orthopedic surgeon who developed this, this test, and therefore may include some bias. A second study conducted in 2015 found the Lieberstein test is designed to have sensitivity of 94% and 98% under anesthesia. To conduct the test, have the patient lying in supine with legs fully extended. The examiner places a fist under the proximal third of the calf and then provides a moderate downward force over the distal third of the patient's quadriceps. With an intact ACL, the downward force applied to the quadriceps will result in the heel rising off the table, indicating a negative test. In a ruptured ACL, the lever created by the ligament to offset gravity is impaired which results in anterior translation of the tibial plateau in relation to the femoral condyles. In this case, the heel will remain on the table, indicating a positive test.